It was just the most massive thing I've ever seen. I, to tell you the honest truth, I thought, well, we're the only ones left on this planet. Something's happened. We've missed something here. The fear that went in me when I seen it was just, um, like the feeling, I'd say it was fear, but I've never felt that feeling before in my entire life. It's a weird feeling, like you can't explain it when you don't know. You feel like you're being followed, but you don't know what it is. We had two to our right, another one in front of us, another one to the left, and another one just across the road, shaking the daylight out of the tree. All we get was a big red eye. I remember waking up and looking at the end of the bed and there was a figure there, almost insect-like, and then I blacked out. Welcome to the show, everyone. My name is Cade Moyer, and you are listening to the Believe Paranormal and UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the podcast, be sure to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen and head on over to our website, believepod.com, and consider becoming a member to get bonus episodes and video content. Tonight, I'm joined by Greg, and Greg is an ex-army man, and it's rather interesting to get this kind of military perspective on what we're going to be talking about tonight, because Greg had a rather fascinating UFO encounter just outside of Bathurst back in 1988. So, Greg, welcome to the show, mate. Oh, hi, Kaden. How are you going? I'm doing really good. And it's been a while since I've actually chatted to someone about a UFO encounter. We've been getting lots and lots of paranormal stories lately. So I am really keen to chat to you about this this really interesting UFO encounter that you had back in 1990, uh, 1988 at Bathurst. Yeah, well, uh, obviously a long time ago. What's it about 30 something years ago now? I was 16 at the time and. Uh, I, uh, for work experience, we were given the opportunity to go somewhere and do something. And at the time, I was very much into aviation. So they spoke to some people in a company called Pacific Aviation, which was basically like a repair center for airplanes. And also, they were like the NRMA of like all aviation. So they would go out to airports and repair aircraft and service aircraft. So I got to do some stuff with these guys, which is pretty cool. And on the first day, it was kind of harrowing. We went out on a twin engine aircraft. And as we took off, the guy says to me, so just hold that door. And we've had some trouble with that. We've got to fly this one to Oxen Park. And we fly over. And the, of course, the door come over. And he goes, just try and hold it. And he called the tower. And he goes, oh, we just got a quick one. We're just going to come back in for a quick landing. And we landed and... And I do remember him trying to ask the control tower to hold the paperwork, but I'm not sure that they did. And then about five days later, we went out in, I'm not sure what would have been that Cessna 172, possibly. We flew out to Bathurst Airport and we landed there and it was a pretty simple job. They changed a couple of tyres. They had some special equipment to do it. And while they were doing that job, we were just sitting around having a chat and they finished it. And the day was sunny, this perfect day. There was almost no clouds. It was a little bit windy. We were looking down the runway. I can't remember what direction or what the runway numbers were because normally you have a runway that's done by a compass bearing. So if it's usually, I believe, if it's, you know, in the direction of 360 degrees, it might be 36. I, I don't know. I can't remember. It's been such a long time. But... Uh, we were at the the rear part of the runway. So we were sitting there. We, we got into the aircraft and they started up. It's, they'd finished the dog job, done their paperwork, and and then he started cursing. So I heard some stuff over the radio because he was announcing to basically take the aircraft off. And he says, oh, we've got to F and wait here for the, you know, the Navy to fly past. But I thought it was rather unusual because at that stage in 1988, the Navy had literally no fixed-wing aircraft. There was no air fleet whatsoever. The Skyhawks had been sold to New Zealand and Melbourne had been cut up for scrap and, you know, the Mackies went back to the Air Force. And so, yeah, I was thinking, what type of aircraft could this be, you know? So we were waiting for it to fly past. 
And as we're waiting for it to fly past, because we didn't have clearance, and whenever you, I'm pretty sure whenever you've got visual guidance when you're flying an aircraft, you have to announce you're taking off from an aircraft to let people know where you are, because he wasn't going by, I believe, the type of flight rules which require navigation, which is a a completely different license. So he was just going by day, visual flight rules, I think. Anyway, so he had to wait for this aircraft to fly over Bathurst Airport. And I said to him, why are they using this airport? He said, oh, they're using it as a waypoint. Now, I didn't understand at the time, but as a military man, I know that you use waypoints to navigate from. So you might navigate on the ground from point A to point B. You might use a mountain as your checkpoint before you do your next navigation where you turn around to a point and take another magnetic bearing. In an aircraft, they might use towns, cities, or landmarks, or mountains, or buildings, or whatever. That's if you're using visual flight rules. So this is what these guys must have been training for. I can only have a guess to it. So this aircraft, we are waiting for it to fly over. It was a naval aircraft, a HS-748, which is a Hawker City 748. I believe they've got a speed of about 370 knots, so it could be wrong. It's an old turboprop aircraft and it was used for navigation and, I don't know, might have been some other kind of training. I'm, I'm not, I don't have the history on that type of aircraft. But before it flew over, probably a few minutes, I observed off to the right, I'd say it's probably the height of about five telegraph poles. So, I don't know, what's that? Three or four hundred metres, I guess. I don't, I don't know, that might be completely out, but the telegraph pole's probably 30 foot, so probably not that much. It, let's say 400 feet. 400 feet. They're what looked like two plastic shopping bags, bags, sorry, just kind of flying around in the sky, like being blown around. And then they started to kind of get closer to one another and they kind of stuck to each other, moving around in the sky. And then they kind of just stopped, you know, beside each other. They were still briefly moving ever so slightly. And then we kind of forgot about them. And then we looked over at these turboprop naval aircraft flying over. It was at about 500 feet. So these things were underneath where this naval aircraft was. And it flew over. And these two things were, were going in the same direction as it, because I said there well, was a bit of wind. But as as it as it went through, they both um, went aligned. So one was in front and one was behind. It almost appeared like they got caught up in the wind wrist behind the aircraft because it flew almost over the top of them. And like it's like they were attached with a rope or something. And then they just followed that plane. And they didn't appear to be shopping bags or white balloons. You can imagine a white balloon flying up high in the sky, 400, 500 feet in the air, and they instantly trailed behind this aircraft. And the aircraft flew off, and the two little white shopping bags or what appeared to look like white shopping bags or balloons basically disappeared with the aircraft as it it flew off. And I looked at the mechanic, because there was a mechanic and a pilot there, and I said, geez, those uh, shopping bags are up pretty high. I said, I, I can't believe they got caught up in, in the plane. He goes, two shopping bags moving at 300, at three or 400 feet at, you know, 300 knots. I don't think so. So it wasn't to that moment that it actually sunk that there may have been something else. That's pretty wild to yeah. to happen in, in such a public place with so many witnesses. They were very small, like they were very small. It's it was a long time ago, so I know I'm I'm going back from four to five hundred feet, but they are up reasonably high. I mean, that aircraft couldn't be below five hundred feet because it, it it goes under different guidelines to be able to do that. But the aircraft was low. It was it was low enough for me to see the RAN insignias on the side of it. I didn't get a tail number, so I don't know what plane it was, but you could definitely see these tiny two little white what they now call Tic Tacs, follow this aircraft. So, And I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about this thing until I saw the the one on the TV with the American jet aircraft. Yeah, with Commander uh, Fraber. 
yeah, saying that they were Tic Tacs. And I thought that's what these things kind of look like, you know, but not solid. They were kind of flopping around. You could tell that the wind was in control of them until the plane flew over. Now, I don't know if two balloons or two shopping bags would do that if a plane flew directly over them and keep following them until they went completely out of sight. But that's what happened. And I'm t- out of sight, I'm talking, I don't know, it was at least two or three lengths of the airport before I saw them disappear behind the plane. And they they increased speed behind that uh, Hawker City at the same speed as what, it, as what the aircraft was. And that, that's basically what I saw. And I, we didn't attribute it, and I didn't attribute it to being some something from out of this world. It was just that strange, you know, some kind of phenomenon. It is rather interesting that the the person whose plane it was kind of identified that what they saw wasn't normal, and instantly said, "Yeah, no, that's not that's that's not a bag. Like that's that's doing things that it shouldn't." Yeah, I mean, I was pretty naive at the time. I'm 16 and probably really don't understand the, the laws of flight, you know, weight, lift, drag, and all that kind of stuff, thrust. And, yeah, I just thought, oh, well, maybe it's just... It just, like, I just thought it, it got caught behind the aircraft's, like, how would you call it, draft. Yeah, like a jet stream um, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but they both went from flopping around like they were nothing to being dead straight and following the plane which is just really weird and I do remember it was July 88 because I went on a skiing trip with my brother right after it and I remember telling everyone on the trip and everyone was pretty blown away because it was the hot story at the time shouldn't be anyway (laughs) yeah I I could imagine like out of everyone who was doing work experience of people in your in your school that was probably the the pick of stories. Oh, most certainly. But I was I was pretty fearful of being uh, probably told off, so I didn't tell anyone at school. I I went and told all my brother's friends, <laughs> but yeah, I kind of kept it to myself and just to not uh, cop any flack. But I'm telling you now, so I know it happened. <laughs> so you were 16 at the time. Yeah. What yeah. was the the vibe of UFOs in? in popular culture back then like was that something that people were talking about because around 88 that's kind of when bob lazar came out and started talking about these things well i'll be honest as a kid i knew nothing about bob lazar what i do remember is television shows like that's incredible and other tv shows like arthur c Clarke's greatest mysteries and another one called In Search Of, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek. The Leonard Nimoy In, in Search Of, you can get it on a DVD, but it's you have to have a foreign DVD player. The other stuff you can find on YouTube. But those kind of shows were the shows where I was kind of mystified as a kid and, and, and blown away by this kind of stuff that give goosebumps. But at the time it happened, I didn't have goosebumps. I didn't think I'd even seen anything. You know, it meant nothing to me. Until the penny dropped when that when that uh, was the aircraft mechanic, you know, which he had the same understanding of flight controls and stuff and flight rules. He he's the one that said it, and there was a very quiet ride back in the cockpit. The only story I remember as a kid was one on that's incredible, which was a whole heap of military Chinooks following this big fiery diamond object. It's quite famous. I, I don't know who the true story but yeah other than those tv shows there was something on the news about a a couple or a group of people in the 80s and a nullable being buzzed by you and phone and there was a road train truck driver as well he he had a story to tell or min min lights or something like that but that's all i remember as a kid so yeah right so you weren't really influenced by by the popular culture aspect of ufos and and like visitors from outer space and things like that not really. I mean, other than it being on TV and being fascinating, I, I, I never start something I, I really didn't look out for. And as at the time, I wouldn't have even identified it or even remember it unless that mechanic had, hadn't said what he said because those guys were pretty serious and pretty sh- shook up. And every time we went to talk about it, they just changed the subject, which I thought was very unusual because 
once they brought it to my attention, all I wanted to do was talk about it. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, they they probably trying to shut this 16-year-old kid up and they've just seen something that's rattled their, you know, their world view and you're just here yeah. like, oh, what was that? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've got to look at it from a from a another perspective and go, well, was it was it something and, you know, some rubbish caught up in the atmosphere, but just the end part of it when when they, when they both went parallel and followed the aircraft it just seems unnatural seemed mechanical yeah that kind of makes sense yeah, yeah seemed controlled like there was yeah. a, a sense of purpose to what it was doing yeah yeah exactly because I mean I've everyone's kind of seen plastic bags get caught up in like whirly winds and, and like you know updrafts oh, and things yeah. like that and it's just a, a sense of randomness to the way that it moves. Nothing, nothing really moves in that that kind of straight parallel line when it comes to airflow, if it's not controlled. Yeah, absolutely. And and you would have think that the momentum would have been lost after a period of time. I don't know if there's, there's people who are physicists or pilots that can elaborate on. You know, because I've got to go back 36 years ago and work out what direction I was facing and a lot of that stuff I've forgotten and, and haven't been able to retain. But yeah, it was definitely interesting and it's definitely something that, that, that did happen and I did witness it. And what it was, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. It could have been anything. Yeah, and I think it's rather <laughs> telling with the the way that the, you know, the, the mechanics responded to this type of encounter that if it if it was just something that was say a plastic bag they they probably wouldn't have been as rattled oh yeah yeah for sure for sure and it did appear like that's what it was like caught up in a like a a how would you say what is it that the higher temperature can actually force things to kind of lift up that's what it just seems like to be caught up in a a wind and kept blowing up and up. And that's why I thought they may have been balloons because they had a similar appearance. But, yeah, they were just lazily floating around until, you know, the aircraft came over and then that's when things kind of started to change. And I would say it's safe to assume that you could hear the plane, but you couldn't hear these things behind it. No, no, not at all. I mean, those old turboprops, are, they're pretty loud. But, uh, yeah, those 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 HSFs, uh, 748s, I don't know when they went out of service, but they're, they're old, old gear, old equipment, so you can hear them coming. Um, yeah. But the whole reason I actually run you up is because I had a recent experience not long ago, totally unrelated to that. Yeah, while I was I'd love work. to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I drive freight trains for a living, and most of the operations is, is basically north of Sydney and up, upwards, up towards Gunnedah and and other remote areas and yeah basically I was coming back from one of those runs at northwest and it would have been about 10 o'clock at night and I was just talking with a like, new guy he's just an observer he's just been newly signed off and he's asked me a lot of questions about the railways and so forth working on all that stuff and this is a very unusual story because I really I don't know how to explain it it's it's very difficult because i've normally you would see something and be able to relate it to something but i can't relate this to anything because i haven't even heard of a story like this before i do remember my my late uncle he was a famous golfer his name was ted balls and he worked out on some uh, crayfish boats in the 70s after he finished playing professional golf and he saw some unusual lights moving along the horizon, like small black dots moving around. And he likened it to something similar to what the UFO sightings that you might have heard the ones. It might have been about 1978 off the coast of New Zealand. They actually got it on camera. And I don't fully recall, but it was on one of the series of In Search Of. And it was an old DC or Dakota DC-3. And they had an Australian film crew on this male, male aircraft filming this UFO. And my aunt, uncle Ted said that's what he saw up the Gulf of Carpentaria. So that's the first and only UFO story I've, I ever heard as a kid. 
Um, so while it's not the same as that, um, it, they were visual lights of some type and obviously witnessed with another person. My observer, my fireman that was with me, it was about 10.30, it was late November last year, and we were working a, a service, a freight service was coming through a place called Black Creek, which is near Brankston in the Hunter Valley. And there's a small dive which goes down and there's like a loop which joins back up to the main track. And we saw what we thought might have been at first was just a fireworks or a flare or something. But can you imagine holding a sparkler as a kid? And when you look at the sparkler at night and then you close your eyes, you can see the outline of the sparkler. It's kind of like the capillary refill of the eye, if you know what I mean. It leaves an imprint on your eye. So you imagine writing something with a sparkler. So what we saw was a light, which probably the the size of a, a pen, like through the window, and it appeared probably, I would say, 300 metres away at about 90 I don't know, 90 metres up. So you watch that three telegraph poles or four telegraph poles up in the sky. And it looked like an upside down fish hook. Sorry, it looked like a fish hook or an upside down question mark. And when it appeared, it appeared from nowhere, like a, a point of nothing. And so it drew this fish hook or upside down question mark. So it's you imagine the question mark part is like squash, like someone sat on it. So it appeared like a drawing, like an extra sketch. Imagine drawing a light, a quarter of light in the middle of the sky and it appearing, doing this hook, and then it went back on itself at the exact same angle that it came in. It came exactly back on itself and disappeared. That happened in what would have been less than half of a second. And we just both happened to see it. And I saw it and I just thought, my eyes playing tricks on me here. And my fireman, he's a young Italian guy, he, the Australian, he just freaked out. He he freaked out, he's going, what the, what the effing hell is that? What is that? He, he jumped out of his skin, you know? And I said, look, man, I, I don't know. I just saw it and just thought this is the strangest thing I've ever seen and I again I never thought of you know unidentified flying objects or whatever they call them these days um what do they call them these days they there's a new name for them yeah the I guess the the new term is UAP UAP yeah so yeah I didn't even think about that I just thought yeah that that's and like like the other thing I saw the more I thought about it the more bizarre it was because how can one point of light exactly appear from one point, do a kind of strange, snaky question mark, go exactly back on itself, exactly the way it appeared, and disappear back to the exact same point? I don't even know what you would call that. I've never even heard or seen it before. And just so you know, we can't drink or take drugs on the railways because we'd lose our job. But it's pretty funny. And he asked me not to tell anyone, but as soon as we did the handover, I told the other crew, and they had a good luck. <laughs> <laughs> he was freaking out, but it was pretty funny. But uh, yeah, I, it just blew me away. And that, that is how I found your site about 12 months ago. I just thought, there's got to be some kind of answer to this. This is, this is weird, you know? Like, I would not call it an identified flying object. I'll call it phenomenon, some kind of scientific phenomenon, because I've got no idea what it is. Yeah, just blew me away. It's it's definitely a first for for me as well. Like I've never heard of a object in the sky that draws a shape, repeats itself back onto itself, and then disappears. It's really unique. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Also, are you wanting more content? Why not become a Believe Plus member? You'll get access to exclusive podcasts and episodes that aren't available to the public. Not only that, you'll also get our regular feed without any ads. 
Head to believepod.com forward slash plus to sign up today for just $5 a month. Yeah, and I'm being fair it was It was about half a second or less than half a second. It happened so quick. And it would, it, my mate was just stunned. And so was I. And if my, if my mate had gonked out or, or was tired or asleep or some, some form and get sometimes, I I would have just gone, oh, it was just Miles playing tricks. But when someone else sees something next to you and you both witness the same thing, it's validation. And that that's that's the scary goosebump aspect. How bright was it when it was when it was drawing the shape. If you can imagine someone with, you know, one of those mag lights, but not LED, not not bright, like halogen light, we're talking old school kind of warm warm light, but more reddish. That kind of makes sense. It wasn't red, but it was kind of like a orangey white warm light. Did it have and kind it, of like a halation effect to it? Define like, halation. For so me. it kind of had a, like, did it have like a, a glow around the light or was it kind of like a, a hard solid ball? Hard solid ball. And because, and the only thing I can think of, I'm, I'm no physicist, but because it was moving so quick is the whole reason why it left the, the, the snake pattern. Because that's all I saw. Well, I saw it disappear onto itself exactly, exactly the way it came, but that was so quick. The shape that it made like appeared longer. So let's just say I drew a line with a pencil, right? And I made a squiggle. That would say that the time it took me to get from A to B was so quick, all you saw was the whole drawing. But it wasn't quick enough that you could still see it appear from point A and end up at point B and then disappear. So you're saying but the path that it travelled stayed illuminated as well? The whole path. And then, but it was so quick when it retracted and so quick when it appeared. It's almost like the, the middle phase of it appearing, it almost stayed for a second. But getting to point A to point B and back from point B to point A was quicker than the section that actually appeared as one whole object. Now, that's going to sound really weird. But that's 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 exactly how it appeared. And we know, both myself and, and my observer, my fireman, we both know that, that that's basically how it appeared. Yeah, that is that is really weird. And, and that's that's just hard playing, for people to understand, yeah. Yeah, like just playing it in my mind right now, I can I can kind of picture how that that looks. But the trying to process that when that would have happened, that would have been rather a unique situation like i can understand why your your foreman there was kind of so freaked out about that because it just doesn't really make sense like it doesn't fit yeah. any kind of mold of what a, a ufo encounter should be not that there mm. is a like a guidebook on here's what a ufo encounter is yeah but that is really quite interesting like it is genuinely a, a first that I've heard for for any type of UFO encounter. Now, here's something that'll that'll blow your mind and blow your listeners' mind, right? Now, okay. Well, firstly, we've got to look at what possibilities of what it could be. It's not a firework. There's no firework in the world that would do that. Was it an insect or a moth? Well, no moths can exactly track back on itself. Now, there's two types of headlights with locomotives. There's LEDs, which are very bright, but they are a cool white light, and the older locomotive lights are like a warm white. So the only thing that I could think if I was trying to be honest with myself is, was there something in the actual halogen globe that did something? But that's impossible too, because where the main beam of the headlight sits, it was way above that. So it was out outside of the lit area of the headlight because it was up fairly high. That makes sense. Like I said, it was up towards 90 metres. And, you know, it's impossible for any kind of electrical arc to appear from one point and then exactly track back onto itself. I I don't even know if it's even possible. So I thought of everything and I really don't have an answer. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question to you was, could this have been some kind of electrical wire 
or something like that. But I couldn't imagine out in these rural areas that there's too many uh, low hanging power lines, especially close to to the road or to the to the train to the the railroad there, because it's it's just so odd. It's just so unique. Yeah. Well, I, to be honest, I don't know what type of coloured arcs there are with electricity. I have seen a power box explode and I have seen wires touch themselves an arc. It didn't look like that. But I will say I have been in through the day and there's there's no wires in that area that actually go over the track. So where roughly where I thought it was. There's a station and there's a road bridge up a bit further. But, yeah, there's no overhanging wires anywhere around there. And if it was electricity, you would have heard something as well. Absolutely. We had the windows down. And, yeah, we were breaking or slowing down because we had some restrictive signals. Well, because we were actually going to relieve a crew, so... And there was another train in front, so... But, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's something that just baffles my mind, mate. I, I just don't know what it is. It would have been rather hair-raising if you were going towards where this happened as well. Yeah, well, that's right. We were actually travelling towards it and it just appeared for a moment and disappeared, like I said, and we were just trying to... Yeah, just trying to work out what it was. Did the Man. the track that you were on, like, did it go under that same path where you saw this thing? It did. Went right underneath it. So there's a big road that goes over it. It's the Newcastle uh, Freeway, which tracks off uh, around Cessnock and goes all the way through to Singleton. So there's a big concrete uh, overpass there. But there were no vehicles. Like I said, it was about 10.30 at night and there were no vehicles that saw go over the bridge and it was way too high above the bridge to be traffic. Um, so, yeah, I, I've i thought of everything. And, I mean, uh, maybe someone else has got a better idea. But it's, I'm open-minded to, to what it might be, what a type of phenomena it is. Yeah, the only other thing that really comes to my mind in a rural area like that would be a Min Min light. Yeah, quite possibly. I must admit, I've never seen one, so I wouldn't know what they look like. But uh, I was very intrigued by the story from the young fellow that she was, had gone out to try and get reception at the back of Queensland. Yeah, I heard that, heard that story. Yeah, and... I listened to a couple. The, the only thing that makes me think that it's not a Min Min light is that Min Min lights usually make themselves fairly well known and will hang, hang around. around or follow yeah. you or try to try to lead you off somewhere like that's the the yeah. whole myth around that type myth of random yeah 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 it's i don't think it was min min light i think it was some kind of scientific phenomena yeah the 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 once again i was talking about mechanical controls like with those other objects at Bathurst, these ones at Black Creek, which is near Brankston, they, for it to actually track back on itself, I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, if you've just seen some kind of light go off to one side or something, I mean, it could be anything. The only thing I thought it might have been, and I'm, I'm not quite sure, but we always see shooting stars. I mean, I've seen, you know, broken bits of meteors, like several, they look like, spark coming back into the atmosphere i've seen oh, a long time ago i saw a, a large piece of space junk or something break up and it basically went daylight and i've seen the ones that change color i've seen the high altitude rockets from i've got a video footage of one i can actually show you yeah and it's it was nothing like any of those um yeah it was what amazing yeah, and I can imagine the the job that you have, it's you're out in the middle of nowhere, so you would kind of get to see all these amazing aspects of Mother Nature. And for something like this to kind of stand out against all of that, I think it's rather telling to say that this doesn't sit in the normal. Like this is this isn't a no. different box and what's what was that? What box did it come out of? What Pandora's box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I, I can just 
tell people, uh, one people in the city to go and do. I had a very good friend of mine, old mate of mine. Um, he he'd uh, never been out in the country, and I and we went out for a bit of a, a road trip one day, and he and I said, oh, there's a we were just taking a leak on the side of the road. I said, there's a shooting star, and he goes, oh, you're bullshit. So he'd never seen a shooting star. And I said, mate, take a look, and he just. He just saw the night sky with no artificial light for the first time in his life. Southern Cross, and of course, you see about 20 or 30 shooting stars in about 15 minutes. Just blew his mind. So anyone out there that's lives in the city, you've got to get out and get out in the bush. Because that's life, man. Oh, stars absolutely. Are beautiful things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It's it. If you are wondering if we are alone in this universe, get out of the city, like you say, go out to the bush and just have a look at those stars because yeah. it will make you realise that there has to be something else out there because it is just such a, a magnificent, crazy, beautiful universe out there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've got to uh, commend you on the x mouth story. That really blew my mind. I, look, I was in the protective services for a while with the federal police, and I've got a few mates that served out up there at Exmouth. They said it was a pretty eerie place. And to be able to relate to, they've told me how the patrols exactly went, exactly how that lady described, and the areas that that she, that she talked about. So yeah, it was pretty hair raising. You've got some got some great content on your uh, podcast mate oh mate the the credit goes to all the all the people who you know kind of <laughs> call in and, and actually share their yes. stories because i i just think of myself as the the vessel to let them get whatever stories they want to share out to the world because without you know people like yourself here greg this this show wouldn't exist it's yeah. we i i purely rely on on people like yourself who who have the courage to come forward and mm. share their stories and it it doesn't matter if someone thinks their story is so minute it every story matters and you know i think your your story from that airport there is a, a real cracker because i it's almost like it took 30 30 years for you to realize that oh geez that that was probably a, a pretty decent ufo encounter and i just kind of love how random that is mate if i hadn't have seen that I'm going to say the the strange sparkler because I don't know how else to describe it. Is someone holding a, a sparkler far away and then moving it really quick, so quick, but moving it and then and and turning it exactly the way that it appeared when they you first saw them, like you went in rewind. If I hadn't saw that 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 night with my mate, I probably would never have talked about the that that identified object at Bathurst. We would never had this discussion. Yeah, and you know what? You you never know, Greg. Like we might have someone out there who's listening to this episode who potentially saw that same thing out at Bathurst because mm. Bathurst is it's not like a, a really big town, but there's enough people out that way who potentially could have seen something. So who knows? We might we might find something in the in the great ether and we may be able to find yeah, someone right. else who saw the the continuation of this flight. Absolutely. You never know. I mean it's uh, it was it's a very strange experience. That I think I think that the core to these things that have happened especially nowadays because so much can be faked with videos and stuff, is people's ability to recall the situation and put the narrative in, in the palms of the listeners so that they can hear what's being said and put themselves. So backstories are important. I, d I don't think people should try and sell the story. I think you should just tell it exactly how you saw it. Um, that's, that's important. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Believe Paranormal and UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and you would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. Finally, don't forget to follow us on all our social media outlets and be sure to join our Discord server to talk to other listeners of the show. You'll find all these links in our show notes. Thank you.